else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy our God who is most, most worthy.
Along the same lines in Psalm 65, verse 8, it says this, The whole earth is filled with the awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns and where evening fades, you call for songs of joy. It says where morning dawns and where evening fades. So across the earth, from one end to the other, God calls for songs of joy. And it's fun to know that we are a part of those songs of joy being called out to God this morning together as a church. During the service today is Kid Zone. And so during the sermon, uh, kids uh, ages 5 and up can go downstairs and there will be a special uh, lesson and activities for them down there. Uh, today after the service is CCW downstairs and a board meeting after church. Uh, next week, we have a special event lined up. We're going to have a block party out here at Madison. And uh, that's just going to be a time for us to get together as a community and celebrate, spending the e- evening together, uh, talking, sitting around a fire later, and we'll play some games, and it'll be a good time. And it's a kid-friendly event. Uh, we, we will provide hot dogs and hamburgers and drinks, and you're invited to bring a side dish or dessert if you wish. And uh, last year, if you were there, you know there was plenty of food and a lot for us to take home uh, and deal with later. Uh, and so that's next week. That starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, that's on Sunday. On Saturday, the day before that, Steve and Marcia are getting married right here. And so that's really exciting. There is an invitation to the reception um, out there in the lobby. And uh, so that's a good transition into our prayer time because uh, we want to lift them up in prayer as they approach that day. And uh, Gary, go ahead. Good morning to everyone. We appreciate your attendance. To our guests and visitors, we say thank you for sharing your hour with us. Uh, At this time, we'll go to prayer, as Joel said. Um, We have a list that uh, maybe has been overlooked a little bit lately. Last month or so has been... uh, It's tested our patience and our understanding with the Molly Tibbetts case, with the tornadoes north and south of us. A lot happened in a short amount of time, but these people are not forgotten. That's on our prayer list if you'd care to look at them. I only have a couple updates that was handed me. Uh, Jack Smith is on his last leg of getting done with basic. Uh, I was told a week and a half he has left. So we need to pray for his safety in them week and a half and also his trip home. I was also informed that uh, Jim McElrath has moved in with Laurel Keller in his room, which I think is a good sign. Um, I don't know the conditions of Jim. I have not talked to Pat for quite some time, but I know she has appreciated the times I've talked to her about all the prayers that we have given her and Jim. So this is a a step up, I think, for Jim, and I'm sure uh, it will go well with them together. Like I said, the Molly Tibbetts has been on everybody's minds. I have no information in what's been released to everybody else. I think um, tomorrow, I think, is another press conference. I have no idea what will be said. So we pray for patience and understanding. Uh, we've prayed for the investigators to do their job, give them the wisdom and knowledge that they have at their disposal to bring Molly home. I uh, have no other prayer request. Uh, I would be happy to entertain any prayer request that anybody else has at this time. I either see, do not see, or I do not hear of any. So I'd like to have a few moments of silence. Uh, Just keep in mind the ones in our prayer list and those that's on your hearts and minds as well. Then I will close. Lord, at this time, we we come with heavy hearts, but we also come with happy hearts as well. We are happy because we know that you are in control of our lives and the situations around our lives. We pray for Jack Smith, for his safe return home here. We pray for for Jim McElrath and Laura Keller as they are reunited here on earth. They both are believers in you and 
and I know that you will hear our prayers for them. For the unspoken this morning, prayers that we have, we lift them up to you, whether it be tears of happiness, or tears of joy, or tears of sorrow. We know that you will hear even the smallest prayer request and listen and do what is right in your name. We continue to pray for Molly Tibbetts. It's a, a hard situation to deal with. We pray for the people that are in charge of her re safe return home. They are trained, give them the wisdom and the knowledge and the know-how to safely return her to us. We pray for the tornado victims who maybe have gotten a little bit overlooked in the press and in our hearts as well. We lift them up to you for the many, many prayers that they have for their health, their safety, rebuilding, as well rebuilding of their own lives. For the unspoken, we lift them up to you as well. We ask all this through your son's Jesus' name. Amen. come to this uh, communion time this morning, I'd like to share with you um, a little bit of one of, the, one of my devotionals that I've been reading, and uh, I just I thought this was kind of pertinent this morning, so, um, and as I would, <coughs> excuse me, in Isaiah 53, verse 3, it says that he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering 
and familiar with pain, like one from whose people hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Now, Jesus wasn't born in a royal palace with great fanfare and parades. He came to us with no dignity at all. His parents weren't married, which probably brought much ridicule on his part. His cradle was a feeding trough, wrapped in rags, born in a cave, targeted for death, and raised on the run. He would grow up to be a friend to sinners and not a friend of Rome. He would spend his life with the ordinary and unimpressive, not the nobility and the aristocratic. He would pay attention to the lepers, the cripples, the blind, beggars, prostitutes, fishermen, women, and children. He would die with even less dignity than he was born with. He was convicted of a crime that he did not commit. He was beaten. He was bleeding, abandoned, naked, and shamed. He had no status. Dignity on the level of a king was the last word that you would use for him. Yet he came to restore dignity to all. He brought an opportunity for all to be part of his kingdom, one very different from Rome. His life was full of blessing, value, and worth with God. The kingdom that Jesus brought would be given to the poor in spirit, the meek, and the persecuted. The kingdom was not built on armies or political power, but it was on the love of a father who was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice so that he could reunite himself with his children. Jesus saw the image of God in everyone, and it caused him to treat people with dignity. This is what the baby in the manger was born to and an heir of. Every human being is made in the image of God and is loved by him. This morning as we gather at this table, and you partake of these emblems, we remember the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus. just wanted you to reflect on those thoughts at this time. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we come with praise and thanksgiving that each one of us are thought worthy enough to be brought into your presence through Jesus. Father, our prayer is that the entire world, all of humanity, would come to a belief and trust in Jesus for their salvation. But we know through your word that Most of the world will not accept that gift. I thank you for those who have accepted it. And you ask a blessing upon each person as they partake. It's all these left up in Jesus' name. Amen.
come before you this morning, knowing that you are giver of everything. I um, just use this money that you seek to the Lord. Help us to give more of our money this week. Help us to give our energy, our thoughts, and our time. In Jesus' name pray. Amen. Together as a church, uh, we've been discussing over the last several weeks uh, the resurrection and the fact that resurrection is at the center of the Christian faith. Uh, the historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead, that we're offered resurrection right now, presently in our lives, that when we give our lives to Jesus, we begin a new life. Also, that resurrection means judgment for the wicked and an eternal hope in heaven with Jesus. Last week, we allowed ourselves to wonder, to use the scriptures to imagine what it will be like on the last day, the day the Bible promises us is coming, the day of Christ's triumphant return, the day of judgment, and the arrival of the new heavens and new earth created by God. It's, it's fascinating to consider that day and what it will be like. It is an entertaining way or an entertaining thing to devote our minds to. It's exhilarating to imagine us being there. You know, for us to imagine it happening before we die, to give witness to it on the earth. Now, one of the great truths about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that um, the return of Jesus Christ is that the dead will raise. So no matter whether or not you've died already or you're still alive when Christ returns, you will witness it. But it's exhilarating nonetheless, and, and every generation of Christians has asked themselves, will Christ return before I die? As early as the New Testament and the apostles, we see that question being asked. There's something extra exciting about the idea of us being on our commute or in our yard or in the field and hearing the trumpet sound of God to know that Christ is on his way back. Now, having completed that study, we're turning back to the Old Testament to a time where we're going to look at one man and the message that he proclaimed to God's people. Those people at that time did not have the same expectation of a victorious return of the Messiah for, uh, for Judgment Day and the arrival of heaven. But they did have a day that they were anticipating. A day of the Lord in which God would bring justice to the world. Sometimes they were excited by that prospect. Sometimes the people of God were calling on God to hasten that day so that judgment could be brought on their enemies. But we know from reading the story of Israel, of God's people in the Old Testament, that this also became a day that they feared because they saw the way that they were behaving, their, un, their own unfaithfulness to God, and understood through the voice of the prophets and through the word of God that if God came to bring justice, that it would not go very well for them. It changed from a day of promise and expectation, anticipation, to a day of fear. The man we're going to look at, the prophet we're going to look at, God chose him and told him that he was going to see the day when God's judgment arrived. That would be exciting for us. You can only imagine the excitement you would feel 
hearing God tell you that you were going to witness the return of Christ. It was not ex as exciting for Jeremiah. Jeremiah was told by God that he was going to witness the arrival of justice from God. Jeremiah knew well enough to not be excited about that. Now, Jeremiah as a prophet is maybe one you're familiar with, particularly because of a famous verse that appears in Jeremiah that you might have on your wall somewhere or on a tattoo, maybe, or uh, somewhere around. You've seen this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have made for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I think these words are often misunderstood, and you may be surprised if this is what you know about Jeremiah. When you read the prophet Jeremiah, it doesn't really sound like the rest of the book of Jeremiah. It's not very well representative of the message that Jeremiah brings. I hope by the time we're done talking about the prophet Jeremiah, we'll understand what God means by these words. But I want to point out one thing about this passage that we'll return to and focus on today. So when God tells the Israelites here in Jeremiah 29, For I know the plans I have for you. Listen to the certainty of God when dealing with the future. It's hard for us to wrap our minds on because we don't see the future like God does, but we are told by God himself that he knows our future, that he knows the plans he has for us, and that will be important today as we look at the call of Jeremiah. During the next few weeks, we'll look at first at who Jeremiah is, how God interacted with him, and then we'll look at the message that he brought to the Israelite people. This morning, we'll learn from God's call to Jeremiah, how God called Jeremiah into his service as a prophet, and see a number of ways in which it parallels our own call to service in God's kingdom. So let's begin reading in Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah 1, starting in verse 1, it says, The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The first thing we're told about Jeremiah is that he is the son of Hilkiah. Now, it's likely that the same Hilkiah here that is the father of Jeremiah is a Hilkiah that is the high priest serving in the time of Josiah. And Hilkiah was the one who essentially facilitated Josiah's discovery of the law of the Lord from the temple and led a great reform. So just you can take away from that that Jeremiah is a preacher's kid. Not, not just any preacher's kid. He's the son of the high priest. He's a pretty, in a pretty important family, in a position to be heard. In Israel. From the events that are described in the book of Jeremiah, we can surmise that when Jeremiah was called, he was younger than 20. He was a very young person when he was called. Jeremiah, uh, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah while Josiah is reigning in Judah. Now, Josiah is the very last good king of Israel. Josiah leads a, uh, I'm sorry, the king of Judah, not of Israel. Uh, Josiah leads a reform in Judah in which the, the temple, worship at the temple is restored. Uh, the celebration of the Passover is restored to where there's this last headlong push to return to true worship of God. As we read elsewhere in the Bible, it was too little and too late, and the reforms of Josiah did not take hold in Judah. He could not shake the idolatry of the people of Israel. It could not be eradicated from the land. So Josiah is the son of the high priest at this time, and the word of the Lord comes to him. And this is how it goes, starting in verse 3. 
It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. There are three actions that God took towards Jeremiah that he says up front here. He tells Jeremiah that I knew you. Before he was formed in the womb, God knew Jeremiah. God set him apart. And God appointed Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations. You can imagine what a surprise it would be for Jeremiah to hear these things. He's a teenager. And here God tells him that before you were born, I picked you for something special. I knew you. I set you apart. I appointed you for a mission. Jeremiah's reply implies some surprise, starting in verse 6. He says, Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth, and he said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Look at what God has told Jeremiah about his calling. Four things. I knew you. I set you apart. I appointed you. And then after Jeremiah's brief objection, I have put my words in your mouth. Four assurances. Four things that God clarifies for Jeremiah upon his call. These were important for Jeremiah to know. Not just because they were true, but because they were useful to Jeremiah. I'm going to ask you to skip down to verse 17 with me. If you're reading along in your bulletin, then it just skips down all by itself. Starting in verse 17, Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land and against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. You see, God is preparing Jeremiah for hostility. God is preparing Jeremiah to encounter opposition in this job that he has set apart Jeremiah for. And these four things that God tells Jeremiah are told to him so that he will know when he encounters this opposition, when he has to have strength and resolve and fortitude, that this mission that he is on is one that God has appointed since before he was formed in the womb. It's one God has always known Jeremiah was supposed to do. And God's own words are in his mouth. Indeed, Jeremiah is going to face opposition. The message that God called Jeremiah to deliver is not an easy one. The job that God has in mind for Nehemiah is not one you would want. I think of a lot of jobs that I had in my life that I did not want. Did you have any of those? Uh, a lot of people have those jobs while they're going to college. Uh, Caitlin, how has digitizing film been going for you this summer? Good? You like it? I remember once uh, being called on late at night because of a water main break in Broken Bow, Nebraska, and going out there at like 10 o'clock at night, and uh, just a messy, wet mess. It was raining, and the rain had 
It had rained so much that it had filled up the storm drain that was running over a water main below it, and the weight of the water in the storm drain had pressed down and broken the water main. So just a huge mess, mess everywhere. So to go out late at night and clean that up, it was miserable. We were there till 3 in the morning. And the next morning, we come back, and we're cleaning up the site, and, uh, and there's a problem because the water main break and all the rain had pushed a bunch of silt and dirt. In western Nebraska, this means sand into the storm drain. And uh, the city guys, who were mostly there to lean on their shovels and tell you what to do, they uh, pointed out that the storm drain wasn't going to work very well, full of sand. And uh, I remember uh, being told to crawl in that storm drain and clean it out. I was given a shovel with no handle, a flashlight, and a five-gallon bucket. <laughs> I'm told to go as far down this storm drain as I can go. <laughs> so I'd go down a little ways, and I'd, it wasn't enough room to kneel. You just crawl down on your belly and scoop some sand into the five-gallon bucket and then try to back your way out. I, and I got about 50 feet down the pipe. There were snakes. That was the worst part. There were a lot of snakes in there. And I, I remember thinking at least they could have stopped running the equipment over the street. <laughs> that, that's a little nerve-wracking too. I just remember thinking, this is the worst moment of my life. <laughs> I, I cannot think of anything I would like to do less than this. That's probably not true. I can think of some other things, but this was pretty bad. Surely you've had jobs like that. Things that you just were not wanting to do. Now, I had some things that comforted me in that situation. I knew that I had been sent there to do that by people who cared for me. It's a family business. <laughs> you may not have had that luxury. Um, <laughs> I knew that there was somebody who knew I was in there and expecting me to come out. I knew that it was pretty unlikely that the equipment they were driving over my head would cave the storm drain. Jeremiah was called to a job that he probably didn't want to do. He's the son of a high priest. He is called to deliver God's message during the height of Josiah's reform when things are looking pretty good. But listen to the message that God tells Jeremiah to deliver, starting in verse 11. We're going back now. Verse 11 of chapter 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. You see, Anathoth, where... Um, where Jeremiah is from, just north of Jerusalem, is still to this day a center for almond growing. It would have been uh, something very familiar to Jeremiah. Now, the word for almond in Hebrew is saked. The word for the, word for the verb to watch is soked. So God is showing in this vision and saying, look, I am watching, waiting for my word to come true waiting for that day of judgment that Israel is expecting to arrive. Another fun thing about the almond tree is that it blooms first. It's first out of the gates. Seeing the almond tree bloom would be the first sign of spring. Jeremiah is told that God is waiting and that he would see the arrival of God's justice, the fulfillment of God's word. Continuing on in verse 13, the word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It's tilting toward us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all those who live in the land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdom, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls. And against the towns of Judah, I will pronounce my judgments on my people because their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshiping what their hands have made. Imagine yourself in Jeremiah's 
position. Imagine the weight placed upon his shoulders to carry this message to the Israelite people. The responsibility of the task which he was called to tell people God's truth at a time when they definitely didn't want to hear it. This is never a message you would want to hear. At that moment, when God called him here and gave him these visions, Jeremiah must have realized that his life was not going to be normal. Yesterday, things seemed normal. He may have had a plan for what he was going to do, how he was going to live. But God calls him here and he realizes that that plan is over. Things have changed. He wouldn't be able to live for whatever purpose he invented or selected. He had something really important to do. Imagine learning that God has a plan for your life, one that he ordained before you were born. Now you can stop imagining and know for certain. Not just for Jeremiah, but that God has called you much in the same way that he called Jeremiah. God came to Jeremiah and he told Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. When Jesus here came to this earth, he told us, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Furthermore, in Ephesians 1, it tells us that God chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless through Christ. Before the world was even created, God knew and chose you. Listen to the words of Psalm 139. There the psalmist says, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Do not read the story of Jeremiah's call and think to yourself, only Jeremiah was known by God before his birth. You were too. God told Jeremiah, I set you apart. Before you were born, I set you apart. 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his, into his wonderful light. You are a chosen people. God's special possession I think also when Jesus was praying for the believers in John 17, he was praying for the believers who would come after him, people who would call on his name. Jesus says this, he says, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. And he asked God to sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Jeremiah is not the only person set apart by God for a purpose. So are you. God goes on to tell Jeremiah, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So too we are told in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. I think again, uh, the prayer that I just mentioned in John 17 where Jesus is praying for the believers, I told you that he prayed that we would be sanctified. He said that uh, we no more belong to the world than he does, which is to say not at all. That sentence is followed by these words. Jesus prays, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. We have been appointed as a prophet to the nations in God. 
Don't think that Jeremiah is the only one who God called to give witness to the truth of his words. He has done the same for you. All these things that God told Jeremiah are true about us as well. This is the point where Jeremiah objected. These are, this is the part in God's, assurances, in God's assurances where Jeremiah said, maybe I'm not the guy you're looking for. I'm young and I don't know how to speak. That is when the Lord reached out his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth and said to him, I have put my words in your mouth. God not only selected Jeremiah for this mission, but God prepared Jeremiah for this mission. God equipped Jeremiah for the mission that he had been chosen for by God. He did this by placing his word in Jeremiah's mouth. In 2 Timothy 3, the Bible tells us this, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Don't think that Jeremiah is the only one given the words of God to proclaim. You also have been given the words of God to proclaim. The Lord Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, recall that he declared, he told his disciples that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and they would be his witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. The Spirit of God is in all who believe. The Spirit testifies through the Word, and through the Spirit, our hearts are filled with God's truth. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us that the words He has spoken are life. That we have that life inside of us through God's Word. The truth is that the story of Jeremiah's calling is not only for Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called for a specific purpose and we'll get to read the message that he delivered to Israel. But because we are the heirs of the promise of faith, because we have received salvation from Jesus Christ and have been filled with His Spirit, you too have been called like Jeremiah. You can be certain of the things that God tells Jeremiah, they are true about you. That before you were born, God knew you. That he has set you apart. That he has appointed you to service. And that he has filled you with God's words. Why Has God done that to us? Why has God regarded us in this manner? Why has He set us apart? Why has He called us on this mission? Why has He filled us with His words? For the same reason that God did so for Jeremiah. God prepared, God with these truths was preparing Jeremiah to face opposition, to endure through struggles to confront the challenges that would uh, come to him in the execution of his duty or his mission. Hear again those words. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land. Against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land, they will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord.
This is a promise to you. Regardless of whether or not you knew it, when you called on Jesus in faith, when you gave your life to him, when you died to sin and took up a new life, you were given a mission in God's kingdom. You are called by God to proclaim his truth to the nations. This is a mission that God has known about and planned since before you were born. He has set you apart and appointed you for this service and given you the words of life so that you may complete your task. Now you must give witness to God and the truth of his word. You may not be a prophet walking into the temple and declaring the doom of God's judgment like Jeremiah. But your life, the one you have right now, this morning, the people who you are interact, will interact with today, God has known about that situation and about your present condition since before you were born. God knew that you would be here this morning to hear these words. God knows who it is in your life that you have the opportunity to share his truth with. To your spouse, your kids, your neighbors, your friends, and your town. You have been made an ambassador of the gospel. The role of the prophet in the Bible is simply somebody who communicated God's truth to God's people. Whether or not they were obedient to God or disobedient to God, the prophet told them the truth, the word of God. You've been given God's word. The same way that God reached out and touched the lips of Jeremiah, God has given you the truth through the scripture, through the person and work of Jesus. And from that, we have a mission. From that gospel, we have been given a purpose and a service in God's kingdom called the same way that Jeremiah was, called to the same kind of life that Jeremiah was. You remember, I asked you to think about how disorienting this would have been for Jeremiah to hear. How disorienting would it be to have God show up one day and tell you, I've been planning something for you from birth, before you were born. In fact, before you were formed in the womb. The same is true of you. God has had in mind works of service the declaration of truth, the role of an ambassador of the gospel, God has had those things in store for you. Now, all that's left is for you to answer God's call and to be a faithful prophet, a faithful witness of his truth in a dark world. When Jeremiah took up that role and was obedient to God's call to prophesy and share his truth, he was opposed, he was persecuted, We'll learn more of the struggles that Jeremiah faced. So to you in your life, if you stand up for the truth in your family, in your community, it may not be easy. But our calling from God means that we must not fear. We have been made a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land. We must not fear or yield to resistance, to opposition, or to hardship. In Christ, because our mission has been known since before the creation of the world, because we have been given the words of God, because we have been set apart and appointed to God's service, there is no fear, 
and there is no other course for our lives. Like Jeremiah, who learned that day that his life couldn't be what he was expecting it to be, the same is true of ours. There is no normal, ordinary life lived on the saved side of the gospel. Every life redeemed by God is called to a mission of sharing God's truth with the world, however you encounter it. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, help us to see our mission. Dear God, in a, in a world that sometimes seems pointless and without end, help us to understand that our lives in you have been given both of those things. Dear God, it, it feels easy, easier for me to ignore the incredible and important work that you have charged in my life. Dear God, fill me with the purpose that comes from being your prophet. Fill me with the purpose. Fill all of us with the purpose that comes from witnessing to your truth in a dark world, in a world that may not want to hear it. Dear God, fill us with the strength that comes from knowing that you've had this plan for our lives all along and that we hold the words of truth on our lips. Help us to declare it with bravery and to serve with consistency and the constant awareness that we've been given a job to do in your kingdom. Pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we close today?